Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I appreciate all of you hanging out with us. I hope you're having a fantastic Thursday. We'll be live tomorrow. I'm home for the next couple of weeks, so a lot of Outkick shows rolling your way. And I want to remind you, as we're getting closer to March Madness, a lot of fun out there. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, you against the number. No sharks. No competitive leagues. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch your winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, enormous selection of player sports stat types. Getting close to the Masters, you can have some fun there. That is what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. You're going to love it. I'll give you some more picks tomorrow if they've got their Saturday college basketball action up because I'm going to be watching a lot of different uh, a lot of different games out there. You guys are going to enjoy it. Trust me, you're going to love it. You're going to be glad that you did it. It's really simple. You're just picking whether somebody's going to make more or less points, assists, rebounds uh, than the number is. Super easy. Download the app today. Use the code OUTKICK, O-U-T, K-I-C-K, I I think I spelled it correctly, for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Again, code OUTKICK, up to $100. Again, this is simple. You put in $100, they give you back $100. You double your money right off the top. Put in 50, they'll give you back 50. Pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Code OUTKICK at Price Picks today. All right, let's dive into it. Uh, Right now, there is a a lot of discussion about what the college football playoff is going to look like. I want to keep hammering this home because you guys know that, humbly, I'm incredible at making judgments. I, You give me options, I'll make the decision that makes the most sense for everybody. As I have long said, I am the King Solomon of the internet, the greatest decider maybe that has ever existed in the history of the world, humbly. Um, And I'm telling you, 12-team playoff, take the top 12 teams, 1-12, to The teams that finish in the first four get automatic buys into the next round. Honestly, right now in a 12-team playoff, and I haven't heard a lot of people talk about this, you know what's maybe the best spot almost? Fifth seed. Think about it. If you're the fifth seed, you get a home playoff game against the 12 seed, which is likely going to be a small school. You will be a home game against a non-Power 5 conference team And you're going to be like a two-touchdown or a three-touchdown favorite at home. And then you get to play against the four at a neutral site the next week. I think there's an argument to be made that the five is almost as good uh, as as winning your conference. Because you might end up in a spot where, let's say, you're the third best SEC team. The five seed might be the team that doesn't even have to play in the SEC championship game and then gets to draw, same thing could be in the Big Ten, and then gets to draw a non-Power 5 conference team as an opponent. I just think it can make a lot of sense. But now they are talking about a 14-team college football playoff. And a 14-team college football playoff before they even get to the start of the 12-team college football playoff. And look, I'm in favor of, I I said from the get-go, just make it 16. Don't ever expand it beyond 16 but just make it 16, put the first three rounds on campus so the higher-seeded team could get to host three straight weeks and then play the championship game uh, like you do in the Super Bowl, put it out to bid, rotate it around. To me, it makes a lot of sense. Go ahead and go to 16. I don't know why you want to give Team 1 and Team 2 automatic buys into anything Just give us 16, but they're talking about 14. And I saw Stuart Mandel out there said, if you go back and add two more teams, uh, that is expand the playoff from 12 to 14, in the past 10 college football playoff fields, uh, here's what you would get. You would get seven more SEC teams. 13 of the 20 teams would have at least three losses. One would be nine and four. The SEC would benefit the most. 
you get six more ACC teams. So the ACC would benefit the second most. Three more Big Ten teams, two more Big 12 teams, one addition of Notre Dame, one addition of Washington State. And last year in a 14-team playoff, the last team in would have been 9-3 and three LSU. Now, I'm not sure that that makes things substantially better for college football. But in general, I would rather have more teams rather than less. But I do think that 16 is probably where you're going to end up with eventually. Uh, and 14 teams with only two teams getting a bye is basically the NFL model, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, who does all the stat checks and research for me. Right now, you get 14 NFL playoff teams and only the top teams in the AFC and only the top teams in the NFC get a bye. So you only have two teams that get buys to the divisional round. And then you have six, if I'm not mistaken, wild card games, three AFC, three NFC. You have four divisional round playoff games, two AFC, two NFC. Then you get the NFC championship game and you get the AFC championship game and then we end up in the Super Bowl. Basically, this is just college football completely copying the way that the NFL does its postseason. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but there used to be, I mean, I know they've changed it a lot. There are 14 teams out of 32 now that make the college football playoff and, uh, sorry, the NFL playoffs, and that effectively they are going to now maybe mimic that before we hardly start the college football playoff. They're already talking about expanding it. I would make it far simpler. I would take, if you're going to go to 14, take the top 14 teams in the college football playoff rankings. And if a non-Power 5 conference team isn't included in the top 14, that's on them. I don't know why you would guarantee a playoff spot to a team that is going to be a two or three touchdown underdog just based on the fact that they're not in one of the now, I guess it's power four conferences. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So again, I would prefer as many teams as possible. 14 teams better than 12, I think. 16 better than 14, but you do need to cap it. I don't think we should ever go to a 32-team playoff. Because basically, although that's kind of interesting, basically if you go there, you're effectively going to end up uh, with the same kind of scenario uh, that we have now, uh, which is, you know, it's almost impossible not to make the playoff if they went to 32. 16 is aspirational. 14 basically mimics what the NFL does, probably gets the uh, college football a little bit more money. That is the same way that it's set up in the NFL. Only two teams get a bye, the number one team in the uh, AFC and the number one team in the NFC. Used to be uh, four teams got a bye. They did away with that. I would just take the top 14 teams, period, make it simple. Um, This story, positive story. Uh, EA Sports is coming out with a new college football video game. My boys are super ecstatic about this. And again, my kids, 16, 13, and 9, I don't know if you have kids, how exactly they play video games. I retired from playing video games because, frankly, I got too old. Um, And my kids now, every now and then, I'll play them in Madden, and they just, even the 9-year-old, just absolutely obliterates me. Their favorite games right now, Fortnite has got some sort of revitalization that's going on because my kids play Fortnite all the time again. They were really into Fortnite. I don't know what they've done. They've got new skins. It's like new uniforms. I don't know if you call it a uniform. Outfits. I don't know what the skins is the word. Um, You know, what your player looks like. Um, And so it's gotten more popular. New worlds, I think. I see my kids playing Fortnite together all the time. Sometimes all three of them will play together. Um, They love Madden. And they like MLB The Show. So the three games that are played most frequently in the Travis household in no particular order, Fortnite, Madden, and MLB The Show. A little bit of FIFA, uh, not much basketball. Those are the three that get played. The kids are ecstatic about the release of the new college football game. They've even downloaded some of the updates. I think the last year they did the college football game was a decade ago, 2014. I know that a lot of you are very excited about this game. 
Uh, it's got a lot of the top voices in college football involved. And it's going to start uh, with each player getting 600 bucks uh, and a copy of the game or whatever else. Here is what I would say. I understand if you are out there and you are saying, if you are a kid and you're on a college football team and you're saying, hey, I want more than $600. My likeness is worth more than $600. I'm going to pull my likeness out of the game. I'm not going to allow my name to be used. It's a really poor choice. Um, I would tell my own boys if they were on college football rosters, branding is the value that you are getting from the college football game. And a lot of people don't understand the value of branding. We have a big radio show, the biggest radio show in the country, Clay and Buck. We don't pay a dollar for anybody to go on our radio show. Nobody gets paid. If you don't want to come on, that's fine. But the value that we provide is we give you the opportunity to talk to an audience of millions of people. Um, I have never been paid to be a guest on any radio show in the country. Never. Some people out there demand payment. I understand it. They're busy. I've always looked at the opportunity to go on radio shows as an opportunity for me to advertise myself for free to an audience that otherwise wouldn't know me. You want to go back in time and you want to study the 20 years of my career, in 2004, when I started writing online for the very first time, 20 years ago, I would go on any radio station in America that would have me as a guest. The way that I ended up on radio, and I've been on radio now for 16 years, is for the first several years, I would go on almost any radio station in America that invited me on for free. I have never been paid a dollar to be a guest on any radio show in America because the branding allowed me to develop my skill set. That's how I found out that I was actually pretty good at radio. If I had been sitting back and I'd been saying, oh, I'm a writer, you're going to have to pay me for my time if you want me to come on your show, I wouldn't have a radio show today. And I wouldn't have the audience that I do. I used the platform of other people's radio shows to advertise my content, and I got a tremendous return for it. If you are a star college football player, there are millions of kids that have no idea that you exist that will become familiar with you from playing the college football game. And so if you're sitting back and saying, I'm only getting $600, I should be getting $6,000, you're thinking incorrectly about what this game has the opportunity to do for you. It is an investment in your brand becoming more valuable than it otherwise would be because you're not trying to make a few hundred dollars, you're trying to make millions of dollars. And I see people all the time in my industry today, worried about picking up nickels and stepping over $5 bills or $5,000 because they're so concerned with trying to get a nickel. Being paid for your content is great. Most people who get paid for their content never make real money. If you want to make real money, you use other people's platforms to make yourself fabulously wealthy. That is what I would be advising my own kids and any kid out there for EA College Sports. Your excellence on the field will create a better brand for you. Every kid in America who's playing it is going to be sitting around saying, man, did you see Nico has got a 4-9 on speed? Nobody can stop him when we do this play. Or they're going to say uh, uh, about, you know, players that otherwise they may not be watching. Man, you see how fast that wide receiver is? You know how unstoppable that slant route is with uh, insert tight end here? They're going to learn your name based on your talent 
which is going to redound to your benefit far more than demanding a few more hundred dollars and holding yourself out of the game. If anything, and I mean this honestly, if anything, you should be paying to be in the game. That's how valuable it is to you. And by the way, this is not some unique thing. We have, I don't know, 75 employees at OutKick now. I don't know what the total number is. I would have killed to be one of the writers at OutKick 15 years ago. To make a decent salary, to write for a platform that has millions of readers a month, I'm getting paid to grow my skills and make millions of people aware of what I do to potentially provide me an opportunity to take the next step in my career. People don't get it. I'm disappointed all the time by young people who just don't understand what they're able to do by building their brands using the platforms of others. And I think this is, I mean, I'll go talk to kids. You got a college football team and you want me to come talk to them? Again, they're worried about nickels and they're stepping over $5 bills or $100 bills because they're worried about nickels. You have the opportunity, if you are an elite college football player, to set yourself up to make hundreds of millions of dollars one day in the NFL. The 50 k that you make in college football should be a drop in the bucket. And actually, the more valuable thing than whatever money you get paid to play college football is the people you can meet who are wildly successful in business that can one day employ you if your athletics career doesn't pan out. And I think this EA Sports College football game, I'm already hearing some guys say, like, I'm not going to let them use my name because I want more than $600. No, no, no. It's the best advertisement for your skill and your talent that you could possibly have millions of people playing with your avatar and becoming aware of your individual ability is setting you up to make tens of millions of dollars in endorsement income down the line. If e, I'll, I'll give you an example. If EA Sports came to me and they said, Clay, we want to use your voice on the college football game, I wouldn't even ask for money. Some of you are going to say, that's crazy, Clay. You could get $250,000. I'd rather for millions of kids to be playing that game and hear my voice. I'll make millions of dollars off that down the road. The 250 k that I get paid for my voice to be used is a pinprick as important as every kid in college football and every kid who's a college football fan hearing my voice and recognizing it. So I'm not even just saying it. I don't know what they paid. Uh, here are the people that are reportedly involved, and I know a lot of these guys. Uh, Kirk Herbstreet, Chris Fowler, David Pollock, Jesse Palmer, Kevin Connors, Desmond Howard, Reese Davis. Basically, ESPN's college football talent all got in the game. I would I would have, if they wanted to use my voice, and I would say the same thing to those guys, as I'm saying to the players, I would say the same thing to Joel Klatt, Gus Johnson, guys that I'm friends with that work at Fox Sports and call college football games, Brady Quinn. I don't even know the full roster of everybody that calls games, Petros Papadakis. The value of all those kids hearing your name and calling the game is way more than anything you could be paid by EA. Same thing for your avatar being used, your individual player. Plus, years from now, years from now, trust me on this, you're going to be putting on EA Sports 2024, and it's going to be 2035, and you're going to have a seven- or eight-year-old that's playing that game, and maybe you didn't have an NFL career. Maybe it didn't work out like you wanted to. You're going to be telling your son, hey, daddy was in this game. Boom, you can play with my avatar. You can play with my team. And I'm here to tell you that's invaluable. I'm just telling you, your son or daughter, if she likes college football, 10 years from now, you being able to say, here were all daddy's teammates. 
you're going to get to meet some of those guys. Your son, your kid playing with your team. Some of you are knuckleheads. You don't understand how badass that's going to be. Just being in the game is going to be worth more than you could be paid to be in the game. So I'm just telling you, I'm telling you how you're going to think one day when you've got kids of your own. I would have loved to have been in a college football video game and be able to show my boys. And my kids would think it's amazing. Just telling you. Uh, long think long range, not short range. And a lot of people think short range. That's why I'm using the example. You're, you're fighting as hard as you can to get a nickel and you're not even looking at the $100 bill that's 10 feet in front of you. Oh, I got to get this nickel right now. You guys are disrespecting me. I want my nickel. Like, bro, there's $100 10 feet in front of you. Just think a little bit about where you're headed as opposed to where you are right now. That $100 bill might blow away because you're obsessed with trying to pick up a nickel. I'm not trying to get you money to buy a Big Mac. I'm trying to get you money to buy a McDonald's. That's what I want for all of you. I don't want you to get a Southwest Airlines ticket. I want you to buy an airplane. Think longer than just the immediate right in front of you right now. Think longer range. Make plans. Take steps. I've been there. I've been poor. I get it. It's hard sometimes to overlook the nickel because you're like, man, that nickel can make a difference in my life right now, not compared to a $100 bill. You're going to spend that money. It's going to be gone. Invest in a career, not a job. Um, this story, it matters a lot to me. I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm incredibly good looking. The reason why I have made a living in media, in video, in radio, in TV, in writing is because I am phenomenally good looking. This is obviously a joke. Uh, I, I'm like Eric, Derek Zoolander, Blue Steel. Like, right, I'm not getting paid because I'm incredibly good looking. Uh, really, what I look like, I just, you know, do you look okay? Do you look like an average guy? I'm, I'm in that category. But if you ever notice, if you're close to me, I don't, I don't wear makeup, by the way. Either people are like, you look old. Yeah, that's because everybody else wears makeup. Maybe in 10 years, I'll start wearing makeup. People are like, you haven't aged at all. Yeah, whatever. Right here, I've got a big scar. I've got a scar right here. I've got a scar right here. Um, when I was six, I was over at my friend Neil Rager's house. I don't know what Neil does now. First grade, Mrs. Miles class at Goodlettsville Elementary. I was over at my friend Neil Rager's house. We both had chicken pox at the same time. I don't know back in the day if you guys, if you're around my age, I know they have a chicken pox vaccine now, and unlike the COVID shot, my understanding is it actually works. That is, it keeps you from getting the virus, not uh, you have to, you don't have to get a booster every year and you still get the virus. Like, you got the chicken pox vaccine and you still got chicken pox, you'd be like, I don't know about this chicken pox vaccine. I think it actually works. I don't know because I got chicken pox. Back in the day, everybody got chicken pox. We had chicken pox parties. Nashville area where I grew up, 1980s, somebody would have chicken pox. All the kids would go play at their house. The idea from the moms was they want you to get chicken pox at a young age because you were inevitably going to get it. And if you got it as an adult, it could be far more dangerous to your health. So they wanted everybody to get it. So most of the kids around me, we all got chicken pox around the same age, five, six years old. I think my sister was four. Everybody that was in my social group, every kid got chicken pox. Um, and so I had chicken pox. I was at my friend Neil Rager's house. My mom was coming to pick us up, and she was going to take us to McDonald's. We were super excited. Wasn't much better in life than being in first grade and getting to go to McDonald's. Got the Happy Meal, got the toy. Who knows what the toy might have been. It was heaven. And I went in the backyard with my friend Neil to see his German shepherd named Casper. They'd had Casper for a few years. He was in a fenced-in backyard. Went out back, reached out my hand to touch Casper. Again, I'm six years old, first grader. And as I do that, Casper, the German shepherd, remember you're little when you're like six years old, so I wasn't that much taller than Casper. 
Casper the German Shepherd leaps into the air and basically rips off half my face. I had, my mom texted me, uh, three surgeries as a little kid on my face after being attacked by this German Shepherd. You could see my cheekbone, the, the blood, the skin was ripped wide open. You could see my cheekbone. Uh, you could see, I had a hole in my cheek, like you could see right through, and I was split all the way up to my nose. The, the thing just bit me right across my whole face. And again, I'm, I'm grown now, but you picture a big German shepherd, fully grown, leaping up and ripping half the face off of a little kid. Now, I was somewhat fortunate, barely missed my eye. I could have lost an eye. Didn't miss my throat by much. If that dog had gotten me in the throat, I might be dead. If that dog had gotten me in the eye, I probably would have one eye today. So as bad as it was, I had over 50 stitches, three surgeries. As bad as it was, I was actually somewhat fortunate in terms of my health. I'm not a big dog guy now. I'm not. Uh, Because when you're little and you get your face ripped off by a dog, you're not the kind of person who sits around and is like, dog's a man best friend. I love dogs. No, when you're six and your face, half your face gets ripped off by a German shepherd, you're scared around dogs for a while because you're small. And I was worried that another one was going to jump up and rip the other half of my face off. Um, so when I see this story about Joe Biden's German shepherd biting 24 different times at the White House, and nothing being done, I flash back to me as a six-year-old and saying, something's really wrong there. You can say, well, it's just a dog. It's not a story. No. This is, to me, a direct correlation between there being no consequences for wrong behavior in the entire Biden universe, whether it's Hunter Biden not paying millions of dollars in tax and being a crack uh, head and a coke addict, and then suddenly there's a big baggie of cocaine at the White House that materializes and nobody has any idea whose it is. And the German Shepherd bites 24 different times. If a dog bites somebody multiple times, I mean bites, not like you're playing and like you're nipping. I mean like bites, breaks the skin and creates the necessity of medical treatment. If that happens twice, in my opinion, the dog should be put down. Because the dog is telling you that for whatever reason, it's been raised poorly. Maybe it's a a bad dog. Maybe it's a bad owner. The dog can't be trusted. I think if you bite somebody, frankly, once and it requires medical treatment, I think you should get put down. Because I don't think you can trust the dog again. And I'm talking about like what happened to me, totally innocent, Six-year-old kid, backyard, I could have gotten killed. That dog should not be allowed to still be out. Because if it'll leap up and rip a face off a little kid, then it could do that to somebody else. 24 times? To me, this is emblematic of a consequence-free White House. And if there are no consequences you're also taking advantage of people that don't have the same resources as you. I really believe you can judge people by how they treat somebody who is beneath them on the social stratosphere. How you treat a waiter or waitress, I think, says a lot about you. How you treat someone at a hotel who is checking you in or a maid at a hotel. I think it says a lot about you. Way more than how you treat somebody in a position of power or how you treat your boss. When you treat someone who is beneath you, who is working for you in an unfair manner or in an unkind manner, and I'm not just talking about people who are assholes, right? If you are the same way to... 
the president of the United States as you are to a hotel maid, and you're sometimes a dickhead, like, that's life, frankly. That's just how the world goes. You treat everybody the same. That should be the goal. Um, but that's not what's happening here. Joe Biden made the Secret Service agents get bit 24 times before there was any consequences. Those Secret Service agents, those White House employees, they didn't have an option to be anywhere else. They couldn't choose to be away from the dog. They were victims of Joe Biden's inability to discipline his dog. There were no consequences 24 different times for Biden's dog behaving. To me, this is just symptomatic of the world that Joe Biden has created, not only for him, by the way, but also for his kids and for Hunter Biden and for Ashley Biden and for himself. There's no consequences for him being unable to do the job. I think consequences matter, and I hope that we're going to see them soon in the the election. Also, I think this ties in with Joe Biden's inability to accede to courts of law. He says that he's canceling student loan debt again. Says that he is canceling student loan debt and that he is no longer going to require whatever it is, 12,000 borrowers to actually pay off their student loans. First of all, this is a major issue for me. Canceling is the wrong word. Canceling presumes that something doesn't exist anymore. The student loan debt is not being canceled. It's just being moved from the obligation of the individual borrower to you and me. We're taking on the $150 billion student loan obligation of the borrower the government is. You and me, the taxpayer. I didn't have any student loan debt yesterday until Joe Biden decided that I did. I paid off my student loans, I think a decade after I finished law school, I paid off all of the obligations that I owed for the law degree that I got. Chances are a lot of you out there watching me right now took out student loans. To me, when you, first of all, allow the media to say the loan debt's being canceled, that's not accurate. Second, I don't think Joe Biden has the ability to do this because the Supreme Court already slapped him down and said he didn't have the authority to take out $400 billion in student loan debt or whatever that number was. He is directly opposed to the Supreme Court. Again, in a consequence-free decision, he is thumbing his nose at the Supreme Court purely for political purposes. If they strike this down, then he's going to then say to these voters, see these awful Republican-appointed Supreme Court justices, they won't allow me to take away your debt. The conversation that we should be having is, Why in the world are we allowing student loan borrowing of this magnitude? You got people who are going to become social workers, and I got no problem with somebody who wants to work in social work, who are going to be teachers who are going to make $45,000 or $50,000 a year for their entire career. You got them taking out sometimes tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans? I don't have a problem with a doctor or a lawyer or a a business school grad or somebody getting an advanced degree that is going to lead to ample income, taking out that money and one day paying it back. I did it. That seems reasonable. But we got people getting... Degrees where they could never pay back six-figure debt, taking out six-figure debt. They may not understand the consequences of basic math. Sadly, that's a huge percentage of the American population. Most people just don't really understand 
how debt works or how it works as a percentage of income. But why aren't we holding these schools accountable? Why are we allowing schools to write debt of hundreds of millions of dollars for their graduates or even people who don't graduate at all and still have the debt, right? Because you can still owe the debt if you drop out after a couple of years. Why are we asking the question why we're allowing them to do that? And remember, they gave the loan. We're basically paying all these schools back for loans that, in my opinion, many of them should have never been able to to grant. We should have means testing on student loans where the universities themselves aren't allowed to take out $150,000 in debt for someone who is getting a degree that will pay them $50,000 a year. That's the real conversation we should be having. And an honest media would be asking these questions as opposed to carrying the water and even using the phrase canceled. It's not true. The loan's not canceled. The obligation to repay the loan is just being moved to a new entity, you and me, the taxpayer, as opposed to the borrower. I think this is a real conversation that an intelligent uh, country would be having. A couple of other stories that are out there. Um, I shared a photo, maybe we can put it up in a shorter version of this, of the Nashville skyline. Compares 2015 and 2024. And that skyline photo, which you can see on my Twitter feed, at Clay Travis, demonstrates the stupendous growth that we have seen in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. And I want to say, I, I tie this in with the prosecution that we're seeing of Donald Trump's business interest in New York. I got a lot of people who listen to me in New York, California, Illinois. Just using those three as an example. If you live in a blue state, get out now. Leave your blue state. Things are getting worse under one-party rule. Come to the state of Tennessee. Come to the state of Texas. Come to the state of Florida. Zero state income tax. When I started OutKick in 2011, early on in my tenure, people said, Clay, that's great. I hope you have success at OutKick. But if you want to really grow this business, you need to leave Nashville and you need to move to New York and L.A. because that's where media businesses are located. I said, no, I'm not moving my family. I like where I live in the Nashville area. I like the state of Tennessee. I'm not going to move. I don't think things can change. I don't think for the rest of my life I will ever live anywhere as my full-time residence than Tennessee. I don't think I'll ever leave. If I did leave now, it would be Florida where we're building a house down on 30A, also no state income tax. If I had to move, uh, you know, maybe I'd look at Houston, maybe I'd look at Dallas if I had to go somewhere. I'm not living in 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 a place other than a red state, okay? I'm telling you, you need to move too. And it's amazing now, everybody wants to come to the state of Tennessee. The conventional wisdom was you can't have success with a media business in Nashville. Now, so many people from New York and L.A., They want to move to a place like Nashville to live and raise their families. I think over the next 25, 30, 40 years, the population growth in places like Texas, Tennessee, and Florida is going to skyrocket. And the amount of people that are fleeing New York and California and Illinois is going to continue to skyrocket. I see it in my neighborhood every day. People coming from Chicago, L.A., San Francisco, New York City, They're all coming here, no state income tax, Florida, Tennessee, Texas, buy stock. Um, Everybody assumes, this ties in with my next thing, everybody assumes that whatever has happened before is going to continue to happen. And they presume that what hasn't happened is never going to happen. That's a huge part of the way the human mind works. We're always preparing for what has happened to happen again 
not for what's never happened to happen for the first time. It's like the story of terror attacks, right? Everything we do is respond to a terror attack that has already happened and try to prevent one like it from happening again. We spend very little time talking about how to prevent a terror attack, for instance, happening ever. So you go get caught in TSA lines. That's all a response to 9-11. The next terror attack is unlikely to be guys with box cutters getting on an airplane and flying it into buildings. It's likely to be something that we haven't ever thought about before. I'm thinking about this recently because the Nikkei, that is the Japanese stock market, hit an all-time high in 1989. I was 10 years old in 1989. I am old enough to remember when there was a panic in the United States with the idea that Japan was going to buy up everything and the Japanese economy was going to surpass the United States economy. This is a major topic. And now I'm seeing it repeated with China. China, oh, China's going to catch the United States. Now suddenly China's economy is collapsing. They're not actually going to get caught. But the Nikkei, the, Chinese, uh, the Japanese stock market, set an all-time high in 1989. It just broke that all-time high today, set 34 years ago. Now, you can point out inflation has happened. It's not actually the same number. It's still far behind. All those things, okay. My point is, everybody out there tells you, buy S&P 500 index funds, and I'm one of the people who says it, Just buy and hold American stocks, and historically, you're going to make 9% a year, on average. That's all the advice retirement people would tell you, everything else. What if we had a 34-year period where our stock market didn't go up? Why, if it could happen to Japan, could it not happen to us? Yes, you can look over the last 120 years, And you can say, on average, stock market's going to return 9% in the United States. Is that true? If it could happen in Japan that their economy and their valuations could get so out of whack that it takes 34 years for a new high to be set, why could that not happen one day in the United States too? I hear nobody talking about it. I bet nobody in America, nobody in the world, forecast in 1989, hey, it's going to take 34 years for the Nikkei to end up at a new high. I bet not one person in the world made that forecast. Yet here we are 34 years later. Well, the U.S. stock market just hit a new high, uh, in uh, the S&P 500 today, I'm not sure if the Dow did. What if a lot of the people watching this right now weren't even alive and we had 34 years where our stock market didn't hit a new high? Just something to think about, kind of the way my brain works. A couple of other stories I want to hit, and then uh, you'll be able to watch, by the way, uh, the uh, next show up on the Outkick Network, which is Hot Mike with uh, Jonathan uh, Jonathan uh, Hutton and Chad Withrow. Um, AI. I am not a super tech guy. I founded a media company. We had success. I got radio. I don't know how AI works. But I am very troubled by this. I don't know how many of you have paid attention to the Google story about you basically being unable to find white people. You search for what a Viking looked like from Google or what the Pope looked like, or you ask about the founding fathers, and many of the results, most of the results, are actually black faces. Crazy, right? You can't even get basic history. What I would say about AI is the same thing I would say about social media. The algorithm determines everything, and the algorithm is made by humans. And it took us about a decade until Elon Musk, 12, 13 years of social media, before Elon Musk bought Twitter and said, hey, I just want a free speech platform. I'm not going to rig it, unlike Instagram, unlike Facebook. 
took 13 or 14 years for actual free speech to emerge on social media platforms. And in the meantime, it was super left wing and it was not an accurate reflection. And the analogy I've made in multiple books, including this one, is that looking on Twitter for what the true American opinion on an issue would be is like looking in a carnival funhouse mirror. Doesn't mean it's not entertaining. It just means that if you adjust your diet choices to based on what people say on social media, uh, it would be like trying to adjust your weight and your eating habits based on the funhouse mirror that you stand in front of in a carnival. It makes you look taller and skinnier, fatter uh, and shorter than you actually are. It's not an accurate reflection of what the real world represents. I'm concerned that we're headed for that in AI and that all these algorithms are going to be super woke and that there isn't going to be, whether it's chat GPT, which I think Microsoft has a huge stake in, or the Google version, there isn't going to be an accurate reflection of the real world in these AI universes. They're going to rig the game to be left-leaning, to be woke. And for those of you out there who don't think about this, whatever you think about Google, by and large, when you do a Google search, you get like seven, eight different options. Maybe you have to go to page two to get the option that you want. All of that factors in. When you actually do a, uh, uh, an AI search using Google, it gives you one answer. It presumes a correct answer. And my point on all of this is that's very dangerous. It's a different version of search. It's a different version of social media. And I think we have to be very, very careful about where the AI is getting its information and how the algorithm is constructed to know what is and is not true. I think one of the situations they found recently was one of these AI uh, services wouldn't give you a picture of Tiananmen Square in China because they're afraid of upsetting the Chinese. Any search service, any social media service is a slave of the algorithm designed by humans. These algorithms need to be public. They need to be open source. We need to know the input that they are being constructed with in order to determine what their output is. I think it's very important. Uh, finally, there's ton OutKick has had a couple of stories up about this. There's been a lot of reaction. Uh, you can go visit the Orlando airport without a ticket now. I believe it's Terminal C at the Orlando airport. You can just go there. You can go eat. You can go drink. I think we got dueling opinions up at OutKick about this. And we just talked about it on Clay and Buck, and I'm honestly super fascinated by it. Uh, because to me, my kids couldn't believe it when we were in Australia. We were able to just go in. They didn't ask you for a ticket when you went through Australian security. You can still go to the gate in Australia even if you don't have a ticket. My kids couldn't believe that you used to, dad and mom, used to be able to go to an airport gate and pick up somebody when they got off an airplane flight. You could stand there. They walk right out of the terminal. You shake their hands. You give them a hug. You, you could walk them to the gate. This was very common to boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, kids. You can still do that in Australia. And so on the one hand, a part of me thinks, okay, maybe that wouldn't be awful because that's the way that I think is you can then have people taking you to your gate. You don't have to wave to them when they go through the TSA security. But I had two big thoughts. One, I've been to the Orlando airport several times. We've flown in there. We've gone to Universal Studios. We've gone to SeaWorld. We've gone to Disney World over the years with my kids. The lines are often brutal. So the last thing I want is more people going through TSA security and making the lines even worse than they would otherwise be, and people are going through, and they aren't even getting on an airplane flight. That, to me, is miserable. Second thing I thought, 
We actually took, I'm, I swear this happened, a, uh, a school field trip to the airport when I was in elementary school. And the idea was, hey, we want to show you what it would be like to get on an airplane. And some people out there are like, are you kidding me? But back in the 1980s, not everybody got on an airplane. My grandfather, Clay Travis, who I was named after, never got on an airplane flight in his entire life. He died in 1990. Eighth grade education, worked in the coal mines. Never, he and my grandma never got on an airplane in their entire life. And in the 1980s, I went to public school with a lot of kids. I didn't fly on airplanes very often. We pretty much drove everywhere. In the 1980s, it wasn't uncommon for you to not be on uh, ever having flown an airplane flight. So I was thinking about this in the context of Orlando. What if you don't have that much money, but you got kids that love airplanes? And you were like, hey, we're going to go to the McDonald's food court. We're going to get you chicken nuggets and a Happy Meal. And we're going to sit and eat French fries and have a Coke and watch airplanes. And I was like, that actually seems like something that you should be able to do. So I'm torn as both the selfish guy who's like, man, this seems miserable. There are going to be longer lines to the TSA. But when I think about it from the perspective of, taking a kid who loves airplanes and you might not be able to afford an airplane flight, but you can afford uh, to get a happy meal and go sit with your kid or your grandkid at the airport. It reminds me of the 1980s when we took this field trip to the airport. We weren't going anywhere, but the idea was, hey, we just want to show you what the airport's like. So for an adult, I can't imagine anything more miserable than going to the airport and not having to fly. But if I think about it from the perspective of a dad or a granddad and having a kid, and maybe you don't have the financial resources to take that kid on a trip, but you want them to see what an airport's like, and they love airplanes, and you want to see like some kids love you know, uh, 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 dump trucks. Some kids love uh, construction. Uh, and so you want to take them and let them go watch uh, how people are building something. I can see how it would be cool to take somebody potentially – and let them, one of your kids, uh, see what the inside of an airport's like. Because for a lot of people, uh, being able to travel and being able to get on airplanes is still a big luxury. And I don't take that for granted. I didn't travel that much on airplanes as a kid. The guy that I was named after never got on an airplane in his whole life. So, uh, you know, as somebody who flies all the time now, you really kind of take it for granted. But there are still a lot of people out there that may be interested in the Orlando area in seeing what an air uh, what an airplane looks like and what an airport looks like because they're not flying all the time. So that's kind of my uh, my uh, way to analyze that. Uh, love all of you. DBAB, unless you need to SBAB, we'll have a show tomorrow on Friday. Hope all of you have fantastic weekends. I'll be back tomorrow.